so today I'm going to talk about optic nerve pit maculopathy um, and kind of what we're contributing to this topic today um, and identifying kind of these three anatomical variations using OCT um, of the different subtypes of maculopathy. Uh, my mentor is Dr. Morris, who, along with Drs. Witherspoon and Kuhn, have been interested in this subject since the late 1980s, um, when they did a similar report that showed successful treatment of optic nerve pit maculopathy in eight consecutive patients by triple treatment, and most recently um, wrote a chapter in the textbook Master Techniques in Ophthalmic Surgery by the same name. So what is an optic nerve pit? Well, it was first described in 1882 by Weath, who had a patient with um, what was described as bilateral optic nerve depressions. Um, it's believed to be caused by incomplete closure of the fetal fissure. It can be bilateral in up to 15% of cases. Um, it's very rare in the general population as far as incidence of about 1 in 11,000 people, but it's clinically relevant because of the high frequency of associated maculopathy that causes visual deterioration, usually presenting for the first time in younger patients. Um, about 25 to 75% of patients with optic nerve pits will develop this associated maculopathy. So what's the background on the topic? Well, it's been known for a while that serous macular detachments and schesis-like separation of the macula um, are sequela of optic nerve pits. However, the causative mechanism of this phenomenon is yet to be established, and therapeutic approach has varied by surgeon widely, um, and we feel that identifying a causative mechanism could help focus and guide treatment. So what is the um, source of the fluid? Kind of the two biggest schools of thought here are, is it liquefied vitreous or is it cerebrospinal fluid? And on the left here, I have a couple of proponents for vitreous being the source of fluid. Dismar et al. Um, described a patient who had silicone oil in the subretinal space following an RD surgery in a, in a patient who had an optic disc pit while Ehlers et al. showed the ability to drain the optic pit-associated subretinal fluid from the vitreous cavity intraoperatively. However, since this, others have um, tried to duplicate this and have not been able to drain the fluid through the vitreous cavity. On the right are a couple of proponents for CSF as the source of fluid. Gas, in 1969, looked at um, two eyes in their histopathologic sections. Um, the eyes were removed by an incorrect diagnosis of malignant melanoma. He looked at these eyes and found that the optic pits um, protruded back through a defect in the lamina cribrosa into the subarachnoid space, which was distended, and that it was um, separated from the subretinal, subretinal space um, just by very thin septa. Kuhn, who has worked extensively with Dr. Morris, reported a case of intracranial migration of silicone oil following vitrectomy in an eye that had an optic nerve pit. And most recently, Gowder um, has used enhanced depth imaging technology of spectral domain OCT to demonstrate this connection between the retinal schesis and the gap in the lamina cribrosa that's present in the optic pit. So we did a retrospective chart review on patients from retina specialists of Alabama that were diagnosed with an optic nerve pit maculopathy and using OCT have been able to identify these three different types of optic nerve pit maculopathy. Um, as said before, this kind of, before the advent of OCT, um, all the maculopathy was described as being this serous kind of neurosensory macular detachment. Then with the use of OCT, when it, we've been able to identify um, a purely intraretinal schesis-like separation as well. And then today, um, for the first time, we um, have reported the case of a tractional maculopathy uh, that's not been previously reported in the liter literature that's caused by a direct connection of the optic nerve pit with the retrohyoid space. So here's the OCT example of our intraretinal maculopathy. And you can see on the left-hand picture here this giant schesis-like separation of the retina. The patient's pre-op visual acuity was 2125. And you can see on the right corner there that direct connection down with the optic pit. This patient um, had a successful vitrectomy and long-acting gas tamponade that closed off this connection of the pit with the fovea, and then the fluid was allowed to resolve over several months. You can see at 11 months post-op, there was still a small amount of fluid remaining, which we uh, propose should continue to resolve with time. Here is our case of a purely submacular, um, subretinal maculopathy. You can see on the fundus photo here the temporal optic pit and the connection with this outlined serous macular detachment. 
And on the OCT, you can see the direct connection with the PID as well. This patient had a pre-op visual acuity of 2040 and was treated with the triple treatment um, described by Dr. Morris. And we'll kind of go into that in detail later. But you can see this kind of echo on the OCT where this chorioretinal barrier laser um, has been applied in the papular macular bundle and sealed off the connection of the pit with the submacular space and allowed resolution of the fluid. And the patient's visual acuity returned to 2025. So this is um, kind of our contribution to these three anatomical subtypes. Um, and it's the first reported case of a traction maculopathy associated with optic nerve pits. It's caused by the exudative fluid coming out of the pit, lifting an intact, solid vitreous face in a very young patient, so that now the vitreous itself has become a tractional arm causing a traction retinal detachment. Um, you can see here the direct connection with the pit, elevating the posterior vitreous face, and the fluid is contained in the retrohyoid space. Here is a fundus photo. You can see the optic pit temporally and this traction along the superior temporal arcade. And here's a good OCT image um, directly visualizing that traction that's causing a traction retinal detachment. This patient's pre-op visual acuity was 2050, and as you can see on the OCT, the little depression, um, that the fovea itself was not directly involved. Um, however, the visual acuity was down because of this opacification from all the fluid that's overlying the macula. This patient underwent a vitrectomy, and six months post-op, the traction retinal detachment has resolved, and their visual acuity was 2020. We feel that this is about the strongest case there is for central for cerebrospinal fluid as a source um, in a young patient who has a solid posterior vitreous face and no liquefied vitreous. So using OCT, we were able to demonstrate these three different um, anatomical variations of optic nerve pit maculopathy and show their direct connectivity in all three, in all three variations, um, which we feel suggests a CSF origin. We also found no break in retinal continuity in the inner layers in any of these OCT sections around the disc. And the minimum agent presentation in our series of 13 shows that there, we don't feel that liquefied vitreous um, could really be the source of fluid, at least in these patients that we examine. So just to kind of touch on treatment here, as we talked about before, there's a wide variation in how these patients are treated. Historically speaking, we've tried everything from observation, patching and bed rest, steroids, mannitol infusion, and all of these things had very limited success and aren't actively uh, mentioned in the literature anymore and have kind of fallen into disuse. Um, as far as surgery goes, there's still a wide variety of choices. Um, some have tried laser photocoagulation alone, intravitreal gas injection alone. Um, one surgeon is even trying buckling of the macula. And nowadays, the most common treatment is vitrectomy with or without creation of a PVD and a with or without gas tamponade, with or without laser. So just to mention this kind of triple treatment that we referred to in our case of the purely subretinal fluid, um, the laser creates a chorioretinal barrier to fluid flow between the pit and the fovea. A uh, krypton red laser is applied to the temporal parapapillary choroid underlying the elevated neurosensory retina and is immediately followed by at least a corvitrectomy with long-acting gas tamponade. So kind of each segment of this triple treatment. The laser is what really creates this permanent barrier to the fluid migration into the macula from the pit defect. It can be done just prior to vitrectomy at the slit lamp or during vitrectomy with an endolaser probe. The preferred method, method is to laser across the bundle while the neurosensory retina is still detached to protect the nerve fiber layer from inadvertent injury. Um, it's 500 micron spots with about 100 to 200 millisecond exposure, delivering this confluent treatment with uniform intensity, um, and you're establishing your test spots outside the macula. The vitrectomy and gas tamponade, the primary purpose is to enable long-acting gas to move the fluid out of the macula and hold the dehydrated retina against the freshly laser-treated choroid long enough to create this permanent chorioretinal barrier. We don't feel creation of a PVD has been very critical to achieve long-term resolution of fluid, and in young patients and patients who have these very fragile schesis-like um, components, it could actually be more risk than benefit. The gas tamponade, it's important that it remains at greater than half of the vitreous cavity for at least 10 days, and we feel it's very important that you reevaluate the macula as soon as the gas bubble has moved um, below the macula so that you can see if you have achieved um, resolution of the fluid, um, so that if you need to, you can always go back in and perform additional gas and additional laser to create this permanent barrier. It's also um, important to have appropriate prone positioning so that the gas tamponade can move the fluid out of the retina. 
and that's it.